I think one of the most frustrating things any parent has to deal with is when their child pulls a temper tantrum. There just doesn't seem to be the right way to deal with a moment like that. The child seems to be totally out of control and there's nothing you can say or do to reach to the child and get them to cooperate and, uh, and act the way they should be. And well, with that in mind, let me tell you about one time I will never forget when I gave my mother a temper tantrum. I couldn't have been more than 45 years old Okay, I'm sorry, four or five years old. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember the details of it, but obviously from the parts of the story I remember, it had something to do with my mother gave me a chore to do, and I just didn't want to do it. And I said no. And she kept reminding me, telling me, it's your duty, you have to do it, whatever it was. No, nope, I wasn't going to move. I was just absolutely stubborn and pouted and carried on and did everything that a child does when a child has a temper tantrum. So finally my mother said, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, go to your room and don't come out until I tell you you can come out. And back in those days when I was a child, going to your room was a punishment because you didn't have an Xbox in there. You had no TV or a stereo or your phone or anything like that. All you had in your bedroom was your bed, your dresser, and your desk. So you slept and did your homework in your room, and that was it. So my mother sent me to the room, and fine, I stamped into the room, slammed the door, screamed and yelled, kicked the walls, you know, you know, cried, you name it. I made all the noise that a child making a temper tantrum does. And I guess I must have eventually at one point just cried myself to sleep. And finally at one point, uh, um, I remember my mother knocking on the door and coming in. She heard quiet in there, and she just called my name, and I looked up at her, and by this time, of course, I had calmed down, and all the anger was gone, and I just said, I'm sorry, Mommy, and you can understand. You can just see the picture there. She says, come here. She gave me a big hug. I went running into her arms. She started wiping the tears away from my eyes and everything, and now that I was listening to her, she was able to explain to me that, you know, I'm not telling you to do something because I want to ruin your fun or make you unhappy or anything like that. We all have jobs we have to do as part of a family. You know, suppose I decided I just didn't want to cook tonight. What would happen? And I remember saying we wouldn't have dinner. And she says, right. So when I'm telling you to do something, it's because we all have to do our part to make our family work. She says, so when I tell you something in the future, will you listen to me? And of course, I gave the obedient, yes, mommy. And then once again, more hugs and all that. And then she goes, okay, mate, now get ready for dinner. And so we did. And of course, we had a meal together. And looking back many years later on that moment, whenever it was the first time that I recalled that and looked back, I realized that probably at that moment was where I understood my mother's love for me more than any other time. Because it's wonderful, parents love their children when they're good, when they're being funny or charming or making them proud or anything. Oh yeah, any parent can love their child then. But when a parent still loves a child, when the child is being difficult, unreasonable, even being sp spiteful, perhaps even hate-filled, and the parent still loves the child, that's when we see the love the most. That that parent loves the child simply because you are my child. Not just because you're making my life easier, but precisely even when you're making my life more difficult, I still don't stop loving you and I still want you to be what you're meant to be. And with that in mind, we have the situation that we have in our readings today. We have to have a little bit of a history lesson with it. Uh, 586 BC was the ultimate moment of that, but uh, after the death of King Solomon, everything kind of fell apart. Uh, for the Jews. It had been, David was the greatest king Israel had ever had, and Solomon reigned in wisdom. They had an empire, and then they started falling into fights with each other. The kingdom divided in two, and the people started, including the kings, worshiping pagan gods and setting up altars of sacrifice to pagan gods in Israel when they were supposed to be worshiping God alone, and things were really getting horrible. And God sent prophet after prophet to them to call them back to him, to worship him and him alone, and they ignored the prophets, treated them terribly. Many of them they actually even put to death, and all of God's warning to them fell on deaf ears, and they told the prophets, we don't want to hear that we're not following God. Don't tell us that. 
So finally, it got to the point they were basically throwing a temper tantrum before the Lord. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do, and they weren't going to listen to God. So finally, God had to give them a timeout, if you will, and he sent them into banishment. In 586 BC, the Babylonians came in, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple that Solomon had built. The Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant were lost to history. And the Jews, who never thought God would do anything to harm Jerusalem, it was his holy city, were taken uh, to Babylon, and only the poorest of the poor, the rabble, were left behind. And the people of Israel, now known as the Jews, since they were the members of the tribe of Judah, sat there in disbelief, saying, I can't believe God allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed. How could he do this? But then again, God sent prophets to them while they were there and said, God did it because you were stubborn. You were not listening to him. But now you must grow and return to your relationship to him. Listen to him. Follow him. Become a people dedicated to God. And when you have done that, the Lord will send you back home again. And this time they listened. They did dedicate themselves to the Lord and they defended their faith even during times of persecution when the, uh, the kings there were trying to force them not to worship God and worship king Nebu- uh, the, the king of the Babylonians or the Babylonian deities. And they said, no, we'd rather die rather than deny the Lord. And so they did remain faithful to the Lord. And after 70 years, finally the Lord had said, okay, now they're ready. Now they can return home. And Cyrus of Persia came along, defeated the Babylonians, and issued an unheard of decree, allowing all the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their city, rebuild their temple, and may your God go with you, he said to them. And the words in our first reading we hear today, some of the most tender and beautiful of all words of Scripture, are the words of the prophet Isaiah declaring this to the exiles in Babylon, comfort Give comfort to my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her service is at an end. Her guilt is expiated. Indeed, she has received double from the hand of the Lord for all of her sins. And then a voice cries out in the desert, make way a highway for the Lord. Let every valley be filled in and every mountain made low so that the path for the people returning to Israel will be a smooth one. And in the gospel, John the Baptist picks up on that theme and he uses the very same words to remind the people that now they have been found ready by God to receive their salvation, to receive Christ. And so he uses those words to remind people, prepare the way for the Lord. Let him come into your hearts so that Christ now who is on the scene will be able to give you the salvation you you so desire. It was that moment of reconciliation where now finally God was going to, was there to forgive them their sins, to suffer and die on the cross and bring them to him. And so he called for a baptism of repentance where people acknowledged their sins and went into the waters of the Jordan and had their sins forgiven while they prepared for Jesus to come to them. And of course, then they were ready for the Lord to come and teach them about the love of God. But the love that they acknowledged and saw most when they saw how much God loved them, even in spite of their sins. And sometimes it seems if you notice that some of the people who follow Jesus the most closely, tax collectors and prostitutes, the greatest sinners who were rejected by everybody else, followed the Lord closely, probably because they realized they had greater sins than other people. And when they brought them to the Lord and found out that Jesus didn't chastise them for their sins, but rather he rejoiced that they left them behind and allowed him to take them away, and they saw the depth of their sinfulness and how much they had to, uh, they owed to the Lord and how unworthy they were of God's forgiveness, yet they received it. They realized just how much Jesus loved them, just how loving God was. And they followed him with their full hearts and abandoned everything else in their former lives and said, my life living before this man who ultimately they discovered this God who loves me is worth sacrificing everything I was holding on to, everything I thought was important, the pleasure, the money, whatever it was, I leave all that beside because I have a God who loves me that much.'" 
And that is the same message for us today in our second Sunday of Advent as we come before the Lord, remembering how he comes to us each and every day in grace, most especially in the grace of the sacrament of reconciliation, in the forgiveness of our sins. Sadly, for a while in our church, we went through, we've gone through a period that in some places is not even completely gone yet, but there was a prevailing mentality among many people that we shouldn't talk as priests, especially about sin and calling people to confess their sins because somehow that put them down. We should only talk about God's love for them and the wonderful things and build them up. And of course, that sounds beautiful. Yet it certainly sounds reaffirming. But when you really think about it, It denies us the knowledge or the ability to know the greatest love of God of all. And that is his forgiveness of our sins, especially when they're the greatest. And sometimes in order to really know the love of God, we have to sink to our lowest. When we finally realize I have nothing in my own to bring before God to say that he should or he deserves to love or forgive me. And we might feel before him, Lord, you should just dismiss me. But then he doesn't and he forgives us and picks us up. Anybody who's been through any type of a rehabilitation program, a drug or alcohol addiction or anything else, knows, and anybody who is dealing with a loved one who is going through that, who is in denial of the seriousness of their illness, knows that they really can't make a change until they hit rock bottom. And when they finally hit rock bottom and have sunk to the depth that they can't go any further down and they may feel absolutely at their worst, That is when God can pick them up and say, okay, now that you've realized the danger that your sins and your activities have done for you, I'm not going to leave you there. Now, let me restore you. And why so many of our greatest saints in the faith have been people who were the greatest of sinners. How many people we've met, people even in ministry, priests and others, who would acknowledge that they were the people who had suffered from some sort of, a, of an abuse, alcohol or um, drug abuse or something, and had to sink to that point. And when they realized God's love for them, what a difference it made in their lives. They saw the love of this God who loved them even when they felt and finally realized there was no reason he should love them. And so... The best thing we can do for people is to lovingly challenge them to acknowledge what we all know in ourselves. We all have sin. None of us is exempt. They may not always be serious sins, but only Jesus and Mary never sinned. All the rest of us have them. And we can try to make people feel better about themselves by ignoring their sins and denying it and saying, well, just don't look at it, just turn a blind eye to it. Or we can say, yes, Bring your sins before the Lord. Acknowledge that you have sins and acknowledge that you can't handle them on your own. You need his strength, even if it's through repeated confession and efforts to try to overcome those sins. In doing that, in sometimes discovering just how much you know, how difficult it is for us. And sometimes, especially people who are fighting the same sins over and over again, they go to confession and say, well, Father, it's the same thing I have to say week after week. Every time I leave, I say I'm going to avoid these sins. And sometimes how frequently after that I fall into it again. And yet the priest never says to the person, you know, God has run out of chances to forgive you. He's tired of you now. When are you just going to bite the bullet and stop? He never says that. He forgives over and over and over again. Even when we might look at ourselves and say, Lord, you have no reason to forgive me. And the answer may come back to us that he says, you're right. There is no reason why I must forgive you. There's no obligation. I love you and I forgive you because you are my child. You are dear to me. And I desire not to punish you for your sins, but to take them away from you and help you to live the life in me that I have created for you to give, to live. And so, my friends, on this second Sunday of Advent, as we long for the Lord to come to us, now we are in the part where we're saying that we need to come to the Lord. It's as if the Lord is saying, come to the Lord Jesus, come to me. And the way we know that love of his most is by acknowledging our sins, bringing them to him, and letting him forgive us.
My dear friends, if there's anyone here today who has been holding something back from the Lord, a sin that has been sitting within our hearts for so long and we've been afraid to bring it to him, don't be afraid. Bring it to him. Let yourself be unburdened of it. Let the Lord take it away. He died to kill our sins. He died for the purpose of offering the sacrifice to take our sins away. And the biggest mistake any one of us could ever make would be to deny that we have sins and not give them to the Lord for him to take them away. So our call to look at our sins is not to push, put us down, but precisely to allow the Lord to lift us up, to show us his love that we realize most when we acknowledge our sins before him and allow him to love us. As a mother loves a child who is repentant after having thrown a tantrum, as the Lord loved the people of Israel after they acknowledged that they had ignored him and even killed the prophets, the Lord will love each and every one of us when he bring, we bring to him all of our sins and say, Lord, I am sorry, forgive me. And he says to us, I do forgive you. Now let me lift you up. Let's forget about those sins. And now let's live the life of joy and peace that I have planned for you. For when we do that, we will know a peace that nothing in the world could ever give. A peace that only comes by drawing near to Christ. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever.